Well, good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, to the ANU and the third panel discussion in the Vote 2016 Federal Elections Series. Um, my name is Michael Brissenden. Uh, I am, uh, as you may know, uh, currently the host of the AM program on the ABC in the mornings on radio. But um, before that, I was the Defence and Security Correspondent um, for a couple of years. And before that, um, I've been a, a foreign correspondent and political reporter for the past 30 years, posted in places like uh, Russia, Europe, the US. Um, so uh, I've been reporting in one way or another on uh, these sorts of issues for, um, for a very long time. Um, now, ev every Tuesday night until the 2nd of July here in the Malonglo Theatre, ANU public policy experts will discuss the key issues of the 2016 federal election. The ANU election series is presented in partnership with policyforum.net, which is based here at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, Policy Forum is the Crawford School's platform for analysis and discussion about the region's public policy challenges. Uh, and the podcast of tonight's panel and every panel in the series will be available. Um, visit anu.edu.au and click on the 2016 Federal Election Series banner to find out more about that. I also invite you to join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag Ozpol at our ANU. Now tonight uh, we're all joined by three of uh, this university's leading security and foreign affairs experts to look at how the 2016 election might change the way Australia deals with the rest of the world and uh, the way the rest of the world deals with us perhaps. Um, our guest uh, coming from the end here is uh, Professor Rory Medcalf. Now he's had more than two decades of experience across diplomacy, intelligence analysis think tanks and journalism, including a formative role as the director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute. Rory's currently the head of the National Security College here at ANU and, uh, importantly, was on the expert panel that helped draw up the 2016 Defence White Paper, uh, which created a lot of news a couple of months ago. Dr Jill Shepherd is a political scientist and survey researcher in the ANU's Australian Centre for Applied Social Research Methods. Jill is a primary author of the ANU poll, a survey of Australia's attitudes towards major issues. Her current research projects explore the role of ethnicity and pre-immigration background on Australian political activists and voting behaviour in federal elections. And of course, Michael Wesley is Professor of International Affairs and Director of the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at ANU. Michael has held appointments at a number of national and international universities and was previously the Assistant Director General for Transnational Issues at the Office of National Assessments, Executive Director for the International Policy at, for International Policy at the Lowy Institute for International Policy, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. So what CVs we have in front of us. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions, um, and then I think at some point we'll throw, throw, the, uh, throw it open to the floor. I'm sure many of you have questions that you, want, you would be keen to hear some answers to as well. Uh, and Rory, I thought uh, we'd start with you um, and, and fo have a look at the white paper and focus on the white paper because uh, while defence and national security generally are, um, are considered to be fairly bipartisan, um, uh, both sides do approach it very seriously and, and both sides try not to uh, make it an issue as such. But the white papers have been quite interesting and I think in 2009 was the first time that we really, um, uh, that the Rudd government really came out focused on China and expressing uh, an opinion that China was a real threat. Uh, and that was drawn, uh, wound back a bit in 2013 and that has been developed again in 2016. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how uh, China, its place in the region and how that's affected our defence thinking and our defence strategy. Sure, look, thanks Michael, and I think, um, you know, the, the key question for me then is how do, how do we connect that, uh, that evolution of thinking about defence and the power balance in China to, I guess, the interests of voters to, uh, to, to the election? So I guess the short uh, version is that uh, from, I guess, around the late 2000s, from around the beginning of the Kevin Rudd period, there was an increasing recognition of China, not as a threat maybe, but as a, a source of risk to Australian security of great uncertainty in the region. Uh, and that's really uh, only continued uh, since then, alongside the, the economic opportunity story. Now, in 2009, in that Defence White Paper, interestingly, a lot of the big ambitions for a more robust Australian Defence Force, especially the idea of 12 submarines, uh, were first articulated. But in the end, 
that turned out to be a case of, I mean, the opposite of diplomacy in a way, sort of speaking loudly uh, and carrying a small stick, uh, which is which is sort of not the way to do it. I like to think we've moved a bit further in the opposite direction since then, and I think the, you know, whatever criticisms you, you would make of the uh, the new white paper, uh, there's now a costed pathway to actually building and acquiring the capabilities Australia needs to be, I guess, a more credible security player in, its, re in, in its region, including 12 submarines. Paper, yeah, and 12, 2013 was essentially a... No, no 2013 was a political <laughs> papering over to yeah. sort of somehow deal with the fact that the government was cutting defence spending while the security environment was getting more troubling. So I'd like to think we've got a more balanced product now and one that... Uh, I think Labor actually quietly has endorsed, uh, so I'd say obviously the big point of difference in the political debate about defence policy is, uh, is obviously the Greens, uh, not Labor. And what about them? Well, interestingly, I mean, <laughs> the, that's fine. Uh, the, I, don't want to, I don't want to take too much of the limelight here, Michael, but the, the, uh, <laughs> the, speech, the, the speech by the Greens leader last week, uh, the Lowy Institute, was a bit, a bit of a landmark in some ways. It was... A, in some ways a serious foray into foreign and security policy by the Greens uh, as a, uh, a third force or as a significant minor party. I, you know, I welcome and applaud that. Uh, I think the, the challenge is that um, Mr Di Natale identified um, you know, problems or criticised particularly the US alliance. Fine, in the age of Trump, it's an understandable position <laughs> to take. Um, but also said, and Australia should cut, essentially cut defence spending there's a fundamental contradiction there that I think the Greens uh, or any other third force are going to have to come to terms with, which is if we rely less on the alliance, we're going to have to begin a conversation with the voters about the fact that they will probably need to spend more on defence, uh, not less. It was an opinion uh, that you don't hear from mainstream politicians in Australia. Uh, well, I don't think I've heard that for a very long time. Um, so in that, in, that, in that sense, it was quite, uh, well, it was quite startling, really, that... Um, a leader of a political party would be prepared to go out in an election campaign and, and, and say that. Yeah, look, I and I think, really fascinating. I think as a, as a provocation to debate, it was worthwhile, but we won't go far in that conversation until parties start, start to craft, uh, you know, credible alternatives to the, uh, I guess, the defence and security policies we have now, and they, and they cost money. Uh, and, Michael, we were talking before, um, we've had three defence white papers in, what, seven years or something. Um, we haven't had a foreign affairs... Um, white paper for a long time, and you're an advocate for one of those. Why? Yeah, look, I think um, the world is becoming a much more complex place. Australia has uh, a number of interests that go in different directions. We've got a primary security relationship with the United States. We've got China as our major trading partner and an increasingly important player in the world. We've got very complex relationships in the South Pacific and in Southeast Asia, um, as well as a number of global interests as well. And I think uh, without a coherent document that sets out Australia's general approach to how it's going to approach and reconcile these different interests, our foreign policy becomes a little bit ad hoc and a little bit reactive. And I don't think we can afford to do that for, for, for too much longer. Uh, it will come to a stage when um, our foreign policy interests start to overlap and start to contradict each other. It, it seems there's been, in terms of the defence white paper, there's always seems to be an ad appetite for another one. There doesn't really mm. seem to be the political momentum uh, pushing for a, uh, for a foreign affairs white Yeah, and it's, it's, it's quite strange because really um, Australian governments of the past, both Labor and Coalition, have been very keen on these. So if... We go back into ancient history, back to 1988-89. Upon becoming Foreign Minister, Gareth Evans set about creating and really articulating a very clear foreign policy that really guided Australia's foreign policy through really a, 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 a time of, of great change, a time of great turmoil and uncertainty. It was the end of the Cold War. A lot of regional relationships were changing. We had the Tiananmen massacre in China. We had a range of different issues that we were dealing with. And then on coming to power the coalition in 1996, Alexander Downer set about doing exactly the same thing, of, of bringing all of the coalition's approach to international affairs and all of Australia's interests together into a foreign policy white paper, which he then updated in 2003. And that got us through a very... Uh, tumultuous and difficult time as well. 
you know, the year that the, um, that the white paper came out, the original white paper came out, we had the Asian financial crisis. Uh, we had uh, the September 11 attacks occur in 2001. And arguably, through that time, uh, not only our diplomatic partners, but pretty much everyone within Australia, and particularly in the Australian government, knew exactly where the Howard government stood on foreign policy issues and knew what the lodestar was and where we were going. Um, arguably, with, with Labor after uh, 2007 and then the coalition after 2013, we haven't really had a coherent sense of, of what the big picture is. Uh, for, for, for both sides of, of politics. And Jill, do you have a view about why that is? Um, uh, why is it that uh, the current crop of um, governments and politicians, generational politicians, don't seem to be quite that interested? Well, I, I, by way of background, I did offer to come and, and sort of, you know, lob some grenades and disagree with both Rory and Michael tonight. And, and I'm... And I'm well on my way to do that. Um, <laughs> I was really struck, first of all, by, by Rory saying, uh, you know, Rory's sort of uh, summary of the, the last defence white paper and that it talked about China as being, you know, a risk if not a threat, but, you know, something that we sort of need to keep one eye on and that at the same time we should expand, uh, expand our military capability. In the same sort of period, we've seen public support for defence spending really drop and this real acceptance with, uh, among the Australian public that, that China's not a risk. And I think that's exactly what you say, these economic opportunities, that the trade potential ha has really, at least the public mind, um, outweighed the, that kind of military risk, right? We, we think in economic terms, we don't think in military terms. So in terms of why, uh, you know, support for <laughs> particularly a, a foreign affairs white paper may have stalled, I mean, Michael has a much better insight into the sort of, you know, political workings, the political economy of this, you might say, but uh, in terms of votes, there's nothing there. And as Rory pointed out as well, the, the both parties are, are fairly set on this fairly boring but um, non-controversial path. You know, we say, oh, we, wouldn't we love for some disagreement between the two major parties and the Greens offer us this? And we go, oh, maybe not that disagreement. <laughs> maybe tone it down a notch. But uh, maybe this will be the impetus. Maybe this, maybe something like the, that kind of, uh, well, I guess the firework that the Greens have let off last week. Maybe this will, will spur the major parties to at least reaffirm that that kind of ostensible uh, bipartisanship. Can I sort of jump in, Go. Michael? I mean, I think you know, I, I I think that the big question is how responsive are the parties going to be to to public opinion? And should they? And be? to what extent should we see leadership, <coughs> uh, or I guess an attempt to frame equation. the debate? You know, and, and these things can sometimes be at odds. And, and, of course, sometimes it depends on where you stand on an issue, whether you want to see leadership or whether, whether you want to see uh, responsiveness to public opinion. Uh, and I think on defence, there's a bit of both. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's obviously different polling out there and, and of course, I completely respect the ANU's polling. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the polling that uh, the Lowy Institute conducts as, you know, as well, for example, is another, another mm. uh, barometer of public opinion. And I think it tells a very mixed story on precisely the things that we're talking about here. Yep. Actual, I wouldn't say comfort with China, but ambivalence about about China, yep. for example. Um, if if the public is if public opinion is that much against defence spending, then why is there a you know a broad bipartisanship now between Labor and mm. the coalition aiming at a two percent target? Uh, so perhaps they're looking at different polls. I don't know. Oh, I think this is possibly an issue that's just been carved off as as allowing for leadership and not being ha not having to be responsive to public opinion. Um, which I think, you know, substantively is a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, you guys can speak, more, <laughs> can speak, uh, you know, more strongly to that than I can. I think what it does, though, is that it really compromises the capacity to have a debate about it. Yeah. Um, if, if we're going to have debate in terms of border protection and border security and, um, you know, irregular asylum seekers, that's well, probably we, not helpful. Can we come to that issue now? Because when we're talking about public opinion, we're talking about uh, an issue that... Uh, certainly both of the major parties believe uh, very strongly that the public supports their positions. Um, it's a very contentious issue, obviously, with some sections of the, uh, of the country, uh, but there does seem to be a, uh, a level of bipartisanship on, on that issue. Um, uh, the Labor Party certainly seems um, concerned not to be seen to be uh, any different from the government, and the government is spending, certainly in the last couple of weeks, there's a lot of energy trying to suggest that they are. Uh, why, firstly, why is this issue so powerful in the community? 
And is there really a difference between uh, where the parties stand, the major parties stand on this? Okay, I think first of all, it's it's. Please interrupt me if if you think I'm missing something or uh, got something wrong. I think there's a, a powerful kind of symbol of sovereignty. There's something about our Australian borders that um, speaks to our kind of nationhood, um, and, and that might be me freestyling a little bit. That's sort of my gut feel in this regard. Uh, it's sort of the one thing that we can control is, is the security of our borders. Um, in terms of, of why Labor is trading so close to the, the coalition line, um, I mean, I can sort of give you the, the technical, boring political science um, explanation, or I could just sort of say, enough people are worried about it, and enough people think that the Liberals have the monopoly on this, that the coalition just head down, you know, batten down the hatches. If we don't talk about it, people aren't thinking about it, people won't vote on that, on that sort of, uh, on that issue. Um, which is a very conversely, the government wants to talk about it all the time. Absolutely, right? We've seen that last week with Dutton. Can I just add that I think on, on this issue and perhaps on the defence issue as well, uh, the real challenge is to have a, um, I think debate is the right thing, but to have uh, a, a sophisticated explanation of the policies and how do you, how do you, uh, how do you manage that within an election, mm. uh, an election process where there is a temptation to go to the three word slogans on both, on all sides of, well, one of, of the issues of the debate. underlying all of this is how much the political leaders have manipulated these issues for their own political ends. Now, uh, I'd be interested to know what your views are on this because um, clearly in many cases um, it's advantageous for them to, uh, to talk these issues up. So. Yeah, can I just come back to an issue that Jill raised? I think she's right. You know, as Laurie Breton said to me uh, many years ago when he was shadow foreign minister, he said, there's no votes in foreign policy, mate. It's all about the trips. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me <laughs> passing that on. Um, but it's true. But I think foreign policy matters uh, in Australian electoral politics in a secondary sense. So we don't mind electing people who have no background in foreign policy, unlike American presidential elections. People go to a, a, a great extent to show that they've got some experience in foreign Except relations. Um, you know, we, yeah, Rudd's a, an interesting exception there. But... But I think, it, I think foreign policy has a secondary effect in that it can be used to illustrate a government's general competence or incompetence. And it was really interesting the way that Rudd used the Iraq wheat scandal uh, in, in 2006 to really erode the Howard government's perception of being a, a safe pair of hands in the Australian population. Um, and I think, conversely, it shows that uh, if you're competent at managing foreign policy. It's not going to get you any votes, but it does kind of contribute to, to your aura of being generally a safe pair of hands. I think the interesting thing for me about asylum seekers and, and irregular arrivals is um, the fact that it is such a, um, a, a, a push-button issue in the electorate, and I think it, it has been used uh, by parties to demonstrate their general safe pair of handedness, if you like, uh, with the electorate. The really interesting thing for me is the willingness of both sides of politics in Australia to mortgage our foreign relations to this domestic political issue. With the, the tow back the boats poli policy, the Tony Abbott opposition showed itself absolutely willing uh, to jeopardise our relationship with Indonesia, and it didn't resolve from that. I think... Uh, but that pushed the debate, didn't it? That changed the debate. It did and change it, the it, debate. And it sort of changed the, uh, the, the centre of the debate, in a sense. Absolutely. And still feeling that. And, and, and I think what's being missed here is that, you know, so I'm not being partisan here, the Rudd government's uh, negotiation of the Asylum Seeker Centre on, on Manus Island, uh, and to a lesser extent uh, on Nauru, uh, really changed the balance of our relationships with the South Pacific. And I think it's put us in a really difficult situation with Papua New Guinea, which is really one of our most important relationships and put us in a very unenviable situation in dealing with that. Just before we open up to questions, can I just ask you uh, on, on the other national security issue on terrorism, uh, do you think that issue has also been uh, manipulated? Is um as some claim, fear uh, a factor, uh, a political factor? 
Well, I think, can I, if I can jump in on that one first, Michael, I think uh, what's interesting is if you look at the succession or the, uh, the change from uh, Abbott to Turnbull, um, you could argue that we have, I mean, we have broadly the same set of policies in place uh, as we had under, uh, under Abbott. In fact, and I think we'd likely have the same set of counterterrorism and countering violent extremism policies in place under Labor for that matter too, but the rhetoric is different. Uh, so I think when you used a term like manipulating the issue earlier, I don't think you could accuse, personally, you could accuse um, uh, Turnbull or Shorten of manipulating that issue to a large degree. Uh, that accusation has obviously been made uh, around, around the Abbott government, but the policies are the same and I think the, 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 the opportunity that political leaders have is to make this an inclusive issue rather than an issue that divides the community. And I think we're actually beginning to move in that direction. We weren't there a year ago, but the, the rhetoric that, um, that Turnbull's used around recognising that actually terrorism is a, th is a threat to Muslim Australians too, uh, and in fact that the, the biggest damage terrorists could do is not only to the, the lives that they might uh, destroy or traumatise, but the, the wider fabric of trust within the community. I think that's the political message that leaders need to get out. And that may, I hope, appeal to a broader spectrum of society than uh, the obvious constituency that would say, look, you know, we're concerned about our safety first and foremost rather than multiculturalism. Okay, at this point, if, there's, uh, if there are any questions, uh, the gentleman here in the front row. Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Very interesting. Um, I just want to recount um, one bit of Australian political history, and that is with uh, Peter Andron. He was the former member of, uh, of Parks. And Parks, of course, is rural New South Wales very high levels of poorly educated people who left school before year 12, fertile ground for Pauline Hanson. Well, Pat Andrew went out pretty hard as the member supporting refugees um, and um, supporting multiculturalism and supporting the immigration program. And at the next election, he got a primary vote, I think, of 60%. And it seems to me, you know, from my experience of campaigning and analysing polls and so forth, that there is a lot of racism out there and there's a lot of fear um, about refugees. But it's actually... While it's very widespread, it's also quite superficial that good political leadership could actually change that. Now, I'm not suggesting the Labor Party should, in the middle of a federal election campaign, suddenly do, do, do a U-turn. Um, but outside an election context, it's just a, a pity that they haven't. And even Malcolm Turnbull, you know, possibly sort of knows better and well done to uh, the Greens for coming out last week, the way they did. Yeah, absolutely. We can be we can be too hasty in dismissing the, the compassion of... of Australians generally. Uh, and when we ask more broadly about uh, attitudes to immigration, people are really expansively supportive. Um, it's just something about that idea of, of irregular boat arrivals that really snaps people into a, a sort of defensive mechanism. Um, and, and on Peter Andrew, and you're exactly right, and I think, you know, um, he's sorely missed. And if we could have more politicians with, with that kind of, uh, I think, capacity to explain you know, to explain sort of the moral basis for issues, well, sure, we'd, we'd all be a happier people, right? And in fact, in some of the rural uh, regional areas, um, the view on immigration and asylum seekers is particularly coloured by the fact that most of them, quite a lot of them are moving there and mm -hmm. taking jobs that others really don't want to do and um, are keeping some of those towns alive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a number of towns out way out west uh, that otherwise would be, you know, pretty much dead. So that may also explain partly, uh, uh, perhaps a different view about it uh, in those areas. Uh, anyway, anyone, anyone here? Gentleman up here. Firstly, thank you for coming and speaking to all of us tonight. Appreciate your insights so far. Um, you've uh, referred to Trump uh, briefly, and I, I guess I just want to uh, raise that. We had Kim Beasley come and talk uh, to Amy a little while ago, and he mentioned that uh, Hillary was probably going to be the next president. Uh, that's looking a little bit less likely now. Um, so I guess generally, where do you see Australia's foreign policy shifting to, uh, given the current US election? And regardless of that, the broader um, framework of Australia being stuck between the hard place that is America and the rock that is China, <laughs> as the sometimes unenviable, unenviable middle power. Look, um, uh, the fact is, whoever's elected to the White House 
you just deal with. Australian governments just deal with them. There's, there's so much at stake in that relationship with the United States. Um, you know, we have had uh, time and again in Australia new, uh, new, new governments elected uh, of a different ideological kind of stripe than uh, have been in the White House. You think, uh, you think back to John Howard's election in 96 when Bill Clinton was in the White House. You think back to um, uh, uh, Kevin Rudd's election in 2007 when George Bush was in the White House. And, and generally because the relationship has such momentum, uh, you know, so many strands to this relationship, and Rory's absolutely right. If we didn't have this relationship, then we wouldn't have the healthcare system, the education system, the welfare system we've got, because we'd be spending it all on weapons and, and military expenditure and intelligence. So there is a huge amount at stake for us. Um, I personally think that uh, a lot of the alarmism around Trump um, is a little bit overdone. Uh, I think back to 2000, uh, where everyone went shock horror, this idiot called George W. Bush is coming along and sure he made a few mistakes but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the fact is that, that uh, when you're a country as big and uh, as prosperous and as powerful as the United States and you have so many global interests, you know, you can say a lot of things as a presidential contender but then when you get into the White House you get hit by a very cold dose of reality. And I think a lot of the settings of American foreign policy reassert themselves. And someone like Trump needs professionals to come along and run US foreign policy. Where, where is he going to get those from? He's going to get them from the same place that a, um, that a Ted Cruz would have got them or a Jeb Bush would have got them. So, yeah, I think, I think... Don't you think it's interesting that he's actually, unlike George W. Bush and unlike a lot of other... Uh, presidential aspiration, uh, presidential uh, hopefuls, he has actually used foreign policy in the primary to actually uh, energise his own voting base sure. uh, to, in a way that I don't think we've seen, uh, well, certainly I don't think we've seen ever in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, I think, is the thing that's really concerning people is because he's actually pinpointed this sort of you know, uh, very different position for the United States in a lot of key foreign policy areas. Sure. Um, but I, I guess I'd go back to uh, an analogy might be Bill Clinton's election in, in 92 where, you know, he spent a lot of time in the election campaign, again playing to his vote, uh, his base, on a very anti-China or a very China sceptical policy. And he got in and he found that trying to enact those policies caused a great deal of turbulence. And by about 94, he'd come around to a much more balanced, much more mainstream China policy. So one can only hope that, that the Donald would do the same thing. I think you have a bit more faith in him than perhaps <laughs> a lot of other people do. Anyone else? Uh, no, no, you go, Rory. I mean, I... I'm a little bit uh, more nervous, I have to say. Uh, I'm delighted that, uh, that you're calm, Michael. I, <laughs> I, I respect that. But, um, you know, I, we, we do have to countenance the possibility that, the, you know, the, the real possibility that, A, he'll win, and, B, he's not just another uh, very conservative American president. He's, he's something else. A lot of the, uh, you know, the, the enormous, uh, I guess, stable of talent in the American foreign and security policy community on the Republican side have signed a never-Trump petition essentially we will not serve a Trump administration now one by one some of those individuals are beginning to sort of you know pivot a little bit or at least are being reached out to by the Trump uh, camp but but yeah a lot will not will, will still not make that jump I mean people like Max Boot who was a you know a uh, you know a, the neocons neocon uh, in, in many ways uh, has, has taken a, uh, a moral stand against Trump so that gives you a sense of the you know of, 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 of the the way the debate has shifted now, how do we respond? I think uh, I agree that uh, Australia deals with the ally that it has, and I think in some ways some of the things that Trump is insisting of allies, Australia's doing already. We are an ally that tends to pull our weight, that tends to contribute a lot more than many others. So in that sense, we've already gone part of the way, part of the way there. But I do think there will be real discomfort 
uh, in the relationship uh, under a Trump presidency. And I do think that a lot of what uh, I think sensible Australian policymakers have been trying to do quite quietly in recent years, which is build a web of other relationships in the region, including with Japan, because interestingly, uh, you know, for all the criticism of the Japan relationship, you could argue that it goes a little way to being a kind of a, a hedge against an America that's less uh, engaged with the region. I think that architecture of Japan, India, Indonesia, Singapore, as we've seen recently, a whole lot of other uh, powers in the middle will become more important for us if uh, America is, uh, Indeed, is, is and a different beast. It does put us in a, in a very difficult position because uh, over the, certainly over the last few years we've become much more enmeshed in, or we've become, you know, we've welcomed a far more involvement of American uh, defence capabilities in Australia itself. That's been a concern to some of our regional neighbours. Now, if America starts going, uh, starts becoming Trump uh, America, that puts us in a very, a much more difficult. I, I don't, I don't actually agree that the. I mean, I think the enmeshment with the alliance obviously raises questions, and it should raise questions in the minds of the Australian public. But I actually, apart from China, I actually haven't seen evidence that the neighbours are particularly worried about it. But there might well, be might different be views. Uh, yeah, well, if, if, I mean, is, you know. <laughs> But it could be hypothetical of because course. the Americans could become less present. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm perhaps more optimistic on, on Trump or less pessimistic is probably a better way to, to, say, uh, to put it. I think what Trump sort of... Um, uh, the kind of opportunities but also the threats that, that I sort of would see regarding Trump at the moment is he cuts across ideology and partisan boundaries in a way that is kind of jarring. And, um, you know, he started off as sort of this relative dove, you know, in the campaign and... <laughs> And then his rhetoric sort of flips and flops and now we don't know how to sort of pigeonhole him as a foreign affairs entity or as a foreign affairs kind of phenomenon. Um, and so there's a huge amount of unknown, right? And unknown is terrifying. But it's classic autocratic behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. We can all sleep tonight. I did see... I was in the US last week and I wasn't so worried about Trump until I saw, you know, CNN every night. And now I'm mildly terrified. Um, but I also saw some really fascinating research while I was there that a lot of his supporters are incredibly moderate. They're just people who feel really disenfranchised, who feel like for so long there's been a Bush or a Clinton or, or some kind of elite, and it seems so bizarre to talk about Trump as a non-elite, but that, they've, that there's this disconnect. And so, dare I say, the parties have brought this on themselves. It, it doesn't help us at all. It doesn't help Australia. Anyone over here? Um, I was just wondering, um, given there is such an amount of unknown with Trump, if he was to get in, which Australian party would foster that relationship <laughs> or would be better, best place to um, deal with that relationship? I, I don't even know. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think you could... Which election are we talking about tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's far more fun than ours, right? Um, I, I, you, you Look... I, Look, I think, you know, both parties have really been competing with each other probably for the last six or seven years to see who could be closer to the United States. You know, we had Julia Gillard go to Washington and give that incredibly gushing speech and then, of course, you know, Tony Abbott and, and now Malcolm Turnbull. Um, look, I think that, uh, that both sides... Let me put it this way. I think the experience of Mark Latham in 2004 shows that there are real electoral consequences to any Australian political leader who is seen to be jeopardising the relationship with the United States. I think that's been a very clear message that has been loud and clear uh, for both major parties in Australia. And so for that reason, there would be a lot of work going into... Um, developing the relationship with the Trump administration. So Trump himself, of course, um, the, the personal relationship is important, but getting to know the administration officials, getting to know the Secretary of State and all of those people... Um, look, you know, I agree, Rory, there have been a lot of high-profile people like Max, Max Boot have said never Trump, but, you know, American administrations are very pragmatic about picking people out of the bureaucracy and and competent people who will serve and serve the United States. And, and for that reason, I also am quite encouraged by the fact that 
Trump doesn't stick to any particular position. He flips and he flops. You know, this is not an ideologue. This is someone who will say and do what he needs to say and do in order to get by. And I think he'll do that in foreign policy. Christian, reliable ally. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my name is Patricia Carl, and I'm one of the Greens candidates for the federal election, so I have to ask a question. <laughs> um, and I'm very interested in what you've said tonight. Thank you. Um, I really like hearing you talking about how we're developing relationships elsewhere, and I'd like, if it's possible, for you to comment on our role to be able to be that a bridging nation, because we don't, you know, we have a foot in so many camps. Um, are you able to comment on that? Thank you. A middle power. Okay. Look, I mean, I I think that's an enormous opportunity Australia has, and I think not only our location, our geography, the fact that we do have a good web of regional relationships, although far too far too few embassies internationally, if anyone from, uh, from that site, from that portfolio is listening. Uh, you know, DFAT is still hopelessly underfunded, uh, tick. But having said that, having said that, um, I guess what I would argue is that um, I differ with this view that it's all about the US and China, that we're somehow, you know, in between the US and China. We're in a multipolar region now. You know, there are other countries that matter whose, uh, you know, countries whose interests and self-respect and, uh, and so on is just as important, actually, to them as China's is to it. So I guess I'd like to see Australia as a bridge in a more multipolar regional context in the Indo-Pacific and, and globally. Now, the big question is how, does the, how do the relationships we have, the big, bi uh, the big bilateral relationships we have, how do they affect our ability to be that that bridge, and I guess, uh, you know, take Trump out of the conversation for a moment, but um, I think generally the alliance with the United States has not been an impediment to Australia being a good partner with other countries in the region, and I think you'd have to ask them what they think of the alliance, but I think generally uh, it, it's a bit of a myth um, that, you know, some would say we either choose between the alliance or good regional partnerships. Uh, so I think I think there's huge opportunity there, and I, I think the principle of that for any party is the is the right principle, and it's a it's an influence multiplier that Australia can have. Uh, uh, good evening. It's great to listen to such an eminent panel as compared to Christopher Pine and Albanese on Quanda uh -huh. talking <laughs> defence last night. Um, just bringing it back, you talked about the foreign affairs white paper. I know in 2013 we released a national security strategy. Now. Given the Indians released non-alignment 2.0, what's the thought of actually whoever is elected releasing something like that as opposed to the individual white papers? We can all jump in on white papers. I, I'll just say briefly. I mean, I, I you know, I, I want to find things to disagree with my colleague Michael on, but the foreign affairs white paper isn't one of them. I think we're well overdue for a foreign affairs white paper. It's been 13 years, and the world has changed a lot since then. The document you refer to is more of a, a non-government document that almost is something that the government can deny was its white paper, but which nonetheless provides a blueprint, uh, you know, uh, I guess the consensus of experts about the direction the country should take. That's a nice fallback if you can't do the real thing, but I think Australia can do the real thing. I'll be provocative and say, oh, God, another white paper. Look, and I appreciate Get something that. something done. I appreciate that cynicism. <laughs> and is there a, just on foreign policy, I mean, apart from... Um, the, I guess the winding back of the foreign aid budget um, in the last couple of budgets. Is there a substantive difference in the way both sides approach this? I mean, I don't sense there is, but I'd be interested to know if you, if you think there is. No, what's, uh, what's interesting to me is so far, and we know that there's four weeks to go, Michael, and that there'll six, be a... Six. six weeks five to go. And five and a half. <laughs> do, we, do we have a, a, a better bit on that? Um, uh, so a lot of the stuff hasn't come out yet, but what's remarkable is is just how little foreign policy has played in the election campaign so far. Um, I mean, I applaud Labor's um, uh, pledge to put back what the what was it a six percent cut that the coalition had announced in the budget, but that's not really a foreign policy. It's not really even a, an aid policy. It's uh, it's just you know we'll put back what they what they cut out. Um, and I, I really do think it, it speaks to a kind of a lack of vision on both sides, a, a, a lack of a willingness to think in big picture terms about what, you know, the foreign policy uh, would look like. You know, uh, it used to be the case that uh, 
particularly whoever was the opposition, would come out with a fully blown, you know, uh, framework for what our foreign policy would be and what it would look like. And I wonder whether both sides of politics are a little bit intimidated by how complex and, and how difficult the outside world is. I think that's probably true. Um, but as you say, you have five and a half weeks to go. You never know. <laughs> Something might, might change. There was a question um, uh, right on the far side over there. This one over here and then we'll go with these two. Oh, it's yeah. up there. Sorry. Okay. There's one. I can, I can throw it if you can catch it. Um, I just have a question about um, what an ideal Pacific policy might look like, sort of a subset of that question. Um, I feel like Australia's invested a lot in success in the Pacific and, and we're actually at a point now where we're starting to see a bit of that. You know, Fiji's had a democratic election. Um, you know, the labour sending countries in the Polynesian areas are, are really, you know, taking off. But there's been a lot of different approaches to the Pacific in the last sort of three governments. And I was just wondering what the panel's views on a sort of an ideal approach would be. So the Pacific has become very complex in recent years. We've got, uh, you know, our um, one of the most successful things we've done in the Pacific, the Ramsey intervention into Solomon Islands, that's drawing down in the next year or so. Uh, yes, Fiji has become uh, democratic, uh, but Fiji is hostile towards Australia. We have uh, increasing numbers of external powers, particularly Asian powers, starting to, uh, to make their mark in the Pacific and starting to complicate things. So Australia's Pacific, and not to mention the issues with PNG and potentially Nauru uh, in relation to the asylum seekers and the, det the detention uh, facilities there. Um, this is a very difficult situation. It's, it's always uh, um, uh, tempting to say this is the most complex situation we've ever faced, but you know, it, the, the, the range of vectors in the Pacific is, is very, very difficult. I think a, a considered Australian policy needs to be one of deep and ongoing engagement with Pacific countries, realising that Australia is sometimes not out their favourite Interlocutor, interlocutor, but we are the essential partner for a lot of Pacific countries. When, F you know, Fiji can be angry at us and Fiji can try and, and exclude us, but when a tsunami hits Fiji, who do they call to come and help out? So we've got to do that, but we've also got to realise that the Pacific is becoming much more complex, that the organisations of the Pacific, the regional organisations, some of which don't include us, are going to play a bigger and bigger role and we need to develop partnerships with some of these other countries that are becoming more and more consequential. I think there are elements of all of that in our Pacific policy at the moment and I understand that DFAT is developing up a comprehensive Pacific strategy which I applaud um, and I think, you know, I, I'm optimistic about the Pacific and Australia's policy there. Yeah, look, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> um, I think I think the uh, one of the things we forget, and it's partly, I mean, this is a Canberra audience tonight, I think everyone's here because they're interested in the issues, um, but you have to bear in mind that I think a large part of the Australian public, the voting public, are not that interested in the Pacific. Um, they, if it was a matter of public opinion rather than leadership, I'm not sure you would find uh, massive constituencies clamouring for Australia to be uh, highly invested in supporting and providing security to all of the small states in the region, even though it is in our interest to do so. So I think there's a, there is a leadership pressure, I think, on all sides of politics in Australia to make the case for Australia to be a good neighbour in the region and to be a generous and supportive neighbour in the region. Uh, but don't assume it's actually what the voters want. I think. In the years ahead, if you look at the whole horizon of challenges and risks and, and threats <coughs> that Australia will face, and actually our limited resources to deal with them all, I mean, it's only a matter of time before we intervene again in the South Pacific in some way or other. You, you know, tensions in Bougainville could arise again, who knows. Um, is it what the Australian public is ready for? I'm not sure that our leaders uh, are preparing the ground for that. Uh, now, I would name um, one or two honourable exceptions. I think the current foreign minister is very personally interested, knowledgeable and passionate about the region. Um, but, you know, chances are that some future foreign minister might not be. And I think, I mean, I think uh, Tanya Plibersek is as well, so we're lucky. But 
in the long run, you know, someone like Kevin Rudd, for example, wasn't yeah. particularly interested in PNG. So we can't count on leadership. We need to somehow uh, bring the public into that uh, into that conversation. I mean, I would expand that that sort of cynical argument to to A generally. Yeah. We sit here and and we are a very Canberra audience, and we do fall into this trap, right, where, um, you know, we bemoan cuts to the aid budget. But outside of, you know, 2600, that's playing really well, probably, I would assume. I would think about my parents in Melbourne. Exactly. And it's, I think, even go further and it's probably playing well. We're, sp we're going to spend money on our own people. And that's the really blunt reality, I think, of a lot of these things. That, so we, there are some of these issues that we need to just... Uh, I think sort of scythe off and and they just need to be uh, leadership issues, we may say. Well, I think we can take that argument too far. I mean, look at the public generosity when things go wrong in the Pacific and people being willing to to contribute and to... And, you know, I, I don't agree with you, Rory. I think that that if, if an intervention comes up again in the South Pacific, I think Ramsey's a good example of most people not noticing. Um, and uh, and governments being able to make very good, you know, public cases for it when they need to. It depends on the scale. I agree. I mean, a short term. I, mean, I know Ramsey wasn't short term, but it was a. I mean, it was it was a walk in the park compared to what we might have to do in PNG, for example. Two billion dollars. Uh, you know. So, Two billion dollars. Yeah, but I, mean, I think you know PNG. Some sort of Australian intervention in the years ahead to provide major security and stability in PNG would be an enormous ask, uh, and I think the public. Uh, is, is not ready for that. I think Ramsey, you know, Ramsey was a, a reasonable sort of mid-level mid-level effort over a sustained period of time. But I, I think, you know, if you if if you ask the public, would they be willing to stump up to do it, to do it again? I'm just not sure. So. Uh, gentleman here, uh, where does the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement fit into this landscape? Oh. <laughs> not, not not neatly. I don't, again, I don't think a lot of Australians know what the TPP is, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think, I think most, Ameri uh, most Australians would, if they thought about a trade agreement, they would think about the trade agreement with the United States, the Howard government negotiated, um, uh, what the TPP means and, and what's in it for them. I, I, I just don't think there's much public resonance. I don't think there's much about the free trade agreements with China, Japan and Korea either, to, for that matter. Um, uh, to the extent that people think about it, they're probably opposed to it because they probably see, you know, cheap imports destroying Australian jobs. But again, I don't think it really resonates. I think that's an interesting kind of uh, hinge, though, that in the past uh, there's been a kind of, uh, I think, a public at least, and this is just gut feel, but a public acceptance of, of bilateral trade agreements as being an unequivocally good thing. We're opening up trade with Thailand or opening up trade with uh, South America or, or sort of whomever. But the TPP seems to have... I mean, well, it's hit a lot of roadblocks, obviously. Um, it's incredibly cumbersome in its detail. It's talking about a lot of things that I think people don't realise go into the guts of these, uh, of these free trade agreements or, by, you know, sort of preferential trade agreements. And so I think that they've hit a real, in terms of public opinion, hit a real uh, obstacle, well, probably an immovable in, in force. US, I mean, you know, it doesn't have a lot of uh, political support in the United States either at the moment. So it's hard to really see where it's going to go. Mm. Uh, personally, I can't see it. Well, Congress isn't going to support it. Neither of the presidential candidates are saying publicly they support it, although Hillary Clinton may well do uh, in the end. But it's going to be difficult to push that one through Congress anyway. Um, there was another question up here, was there? Yep. Thank you. <coughs> um, if Bill Shorten manages to win this election, we'll have had six Prime Ministers, seven if you want to count word twice, uh, in the past ten years. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you, from a foreign affairs perspective, how do you think that affects how we're seen by the world and how we, you know, interact with the world? Well, you know that joke they used to say about Italian governments? So they're saying it about Australian yeah. governments. So. <laughs> You've answered your own question, basically. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I think it... Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, I, look... <laughs> look, I mean... To, to, I think, essentially, most governments look at the change of leaders 
In a similar way that most governments looked at those changes of Japanese leaders uh, over many years, they see the change of leaders but they see continuities in policy. We haven't seen wildly fluctuating policy between one Prime Minister and another. Um, you know, sure, Tony Abbott was more sceptical about climate change and... Um, but, but in general, uh, the tenor of bilateral relations, even with Indonesia over the Tobax policy, you know, it was, it was kind of managed. Um, and, you know, I think there is, a, there is a, uh, an essential pragmatism out there that, that, you know, whoever's really in charge of uh, Australian foreign policy, it'll be broadly the same. I hate to disagree with, with you again, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I mean, I, I think uh, it, it's true until you come up with some pretty significant exceptions. But the submarine issue, whatever uh, the reality, the perception is you change the Prime Minister, you change the country with which we've done the $50 billion plus deal. Um, I think Indonesia, certainly Malcolm Turnbull made hay of the fact that um, he got a much better reception from uh, Jokowi when he went to Jakarta uh, because he wasn't Abbott. Uh, now, that may have been, you know, opportunism... But uh, I, I, I tend to think that perceptions about leaders uh, matters perhaps even more than it did previously uh, in, in these relationships. So I think, it's, I think it's been a net negative for Australia that we've had so many in such a short time uh, in terms of our reliability, the perceived reliability as a partner. Uh, one more up the back there. Yep. Yeah, this one's for Rory and hopefully Michael might have a view too. Rory, today you've called for, in your uh, op-ed, an innovative national security strategy, vice one that's draped in the flag and just nearly a shopping list. Um, do you think our bureaucracies here in Canberra are actually capable of coming up with a thematic response to the world's issues, vice uh, what our usual way is of, you know, comfortably existing in our stovepipes and probably not being too innovative with uh, stifling layers of approvals that many of us in this room probably have to face. Can we do what you've called for? Now you're not going to ask me to um, issue a blanket criticism of the Canberra bureaucracy, are you? Because, you know, that's, apart from anything else, the National Security College helps train the Canberra bureaucracy. <laughs> so it would be, it would be a, little, a little rich. Look, um, the point I was making, and I think, you know, we've all thought and written about these, these issues, is that uh, the challenges facing Australia, whatever position you take, you know, whether it's, whether it's the Greens' position or whether it's uh, one of the, the two main parties, are much more complex and much more, I guess, about a nexus of the international and domestic than they've been in the past. You know, we talk now about terrorism, for example. It's a domestic issue, but it's also an international issue. You talk about the effects of climate change. It's both domestic and international. So you can no longer have siloed policy responses to these issues, no matter where you stand. Now, is the Canberra bureaucracy up to it? I would turn the question around and say, is our political class up to it? Because in many ways, the bureaucracy is going to be responsive to our political class. The best thing the bureaucracy can do, uh, and this is partly because we're, we're prisoners of, uh, of the geography that Federation gave us, um, is to get out of Canberra a bit more and basically take soundings from the much more diverse multicultural Australia that we're, and, and indeed uh, much more private sector focused Australia that we've, that we've become. Because if there's one risk in this from a bureaucratic point of view, it's that, is it, it's that consultation is still generally done as sort of lip service or window dressing or something after the fact of policy. But I certainly wouldn't pin the blame on the bureaucracy for that. I think it's principally about the political direction that they get. A lot of, a lot of this comes down to that though, right? So, I mean, this is sort of at the heart of, of everything, I guess, and, and what I'm trying to sort of inject to this uh, discussion is how do we have these conversations? So, you know, the idea of, of coming up with a, a wholesale foreign affairs, you know, strategy, it, we never get the space and the, the fresh air to kind of have well, that who's, conversation. Who's we? The country. I'm talking in very grandiose terms here, Rory, but, but the, you're right, the political class. They should do something about it. They should. Probably the media should do. Well, well I think we're, 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 we're in a university, right? which is probably the best place to start. If yeah, you're going absolutely. to create the space, this is the place. I think we've got time for one more. If there's um, someone who hasn't had a... Some, one over there, is there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're in charge. You've got the microphone. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your insights this evening. There are, in fact, 39 days remaining of the election campaign. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Long story that we shouldn't need to go into. 
Um, <laughs> my question pertains to um, the comment you made before about um, ambivalence towards China um, amongst our electorate. If things continue to escalate in the South China Sea, and particularly following the ITLOS um, arbitration, do you think that ambivalence will be tenable? And if not, then how do you think our political classes will or should respond? Pe people don't know what the South China Sea is or, or, what, the, or, or what it is or what is happening there. Um, and that's... Sorry. <laughs> and I think... This, but this is sort of the interesting, well, what I hope is an interesting contrast I made before with, um, you know, that the complete disconnect between public opinion over the last 10 years and the kind of themes that arose from the last defence white paper. Yeah, at the risk of sounding like Henry Kissinger, I think we've got to be very careful um, about allowing policy to be determined by short-term movements in public opinion. So when, when public passions are aroused or not aroused, that should not be how we shape our foreign policy. We should be thinking very much about interests and, and general international stability and, and other, other issues as well. Foreign policy, I mean, public opinion obviously matters, but as, as a more background factor, you've, you, you've got to make foreign policy in a way that the public that resonates with the public and that the public responds to. But when you get... Uh, governments making foreign policy according particularly to nationalist sentiment, that's when you get real danger coming into international relations. And, and that really has never happened here. I mean, we, we have never had a population that's been terribly interested in, in, broad, in the broad sense in foreign policy. And we've never had really had governments who've used um, popular opinion to set foreign policy, have we? I, I can't I mean, think I'd, of, uh, the, the exception you know, I'd make would Vietnam, be, maybe, would uh, be East policy. Timor. I think East Timor um, really, really changed government policy. That, that wasn't nationalism, that was genuine concern. Mm. Um, but I can't think of a really nationalistic is issue. Chappelle Corby. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, no, seriously. I mean, I think that, that was the one thing that resonated with people about Indonesia. And that had some pretty serious policy consequences at the time mm. because um, the Howard government was very, very worried about how um, that was being perceived by people. But mm. it takes something like that, a sort of populist issue like that, to engage the broader electorate in, uh, in foreign policy generally. But I think, I think governments like that in China um, realise that when they try and kind of stoke up the nationalist card mm. that it's a very, very dangerous thing to do because it actually restricts their own freedom of action. And so what we've seen in China in recent years has been a government that has been um, more than willing to clamp down on nationalist sentiment when it looks like getting out of control and, and really restricting what the Chinese government can do in relation to issues such as, you know, the, the Diaoyu or Senkaku Islands. I mean, it is, Sorry, it is a two-stage game. There, there is a domestic game and a foreign game. And I just wanted to apologise to the extent that I am involved in stoking these, these short-term policy, you know, public opinion kind of trends, but I think Mark was absolutely right. Can I just say something briefly on this South China Sea issue? I mean, I think, I think the bigger question, I think that's you know, it's a perfectly valid question, but the bigger question is the long-term tensions within Australian public opinion, the ambivalence around the security influence of the rise of China and obviously the economic opportunities there. Um, I think that... Uh, Again, because we're, in, we're sitting in Canberra, we're not sitting in, in the bigger, broader, uh, more complex Australia. But I think the we, real are, world. we are seeing... I didn't say that, and I love Canberra. Um, but, but I do think that we tend to underestimate how uh, fragmented Australian public opinion is becoming on a lot of these issues. I mean, we had recently a statement put out by a group claiming to represent the Chinese community in Sydney. It clearly didn't represent the wonderfully diverse and complicated Chinese community in Sydney... But a small group put out a statement basically insisting that the Turnbull government adhere to the Chinese line on China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. Now, nothing is more likely to upset the self-respect of the wider Australian public than that kind of, um, I guess, that kind of uh, attempt to bring foreign policy into domestic, uh, domestic uh, politics and interests. So I think the strength of the Australian community will continue to be its diversity, uh, but it will be tested when we, when we come to uh, geopolitical tensions in the region or other, or other tensions where the interests of 
the diverse Australian community intersect with what's going on in the wider world. And I do think, in a way, we're reaching a point in the years ahead where we won't, as a nation, be able to hide from uh, the, the tensions of the wider world anymore. Great. Well, I think that's where we're going to leave it, is it? Yep. Um, thank you very much. Um, very Canberra audience. <laughs> Bless them. <laughs> Please, thank our, uh, thank our panel.